Today, I'd like to talk to you about what I do and what sucks about it. To give you a little bit of context, this is the kind of work that I create. I do a little bit of everything from uh, talking to clients, pre-production, shoot, post-production, editing, marketing, just about every single step on the way. And this takes me about six months uh, per project. And the reason I spend so much time to create these projects is because there are 3.3 million Facebook posts created every 60 seconds. There is a lot of content being created, and in order to stand out, I have found that you need to do something really extraordinary. Now, beyond the views, the real reason why I want to get these views is because of the reason I do the work that I do. Lately, I've been focusing on creating work that focuses on social impact. Uh, and in this case, I'm trying to highlight electronic waste and the potential that it has. And I've found that it is the best way to educate through adventure. Um, there are tons of documentaries out there, but for someone to want to look at it is a whole different question. So I trick people by creating something really flashy so that they look at it and they wonder how it's done, and along the way, then I have the opportunity to educate them on, well, did you know that old electronics could be recycled to power new devices, and that um, old circuit boards sometimes have up to 400 times more gold than when it's found raw on the ground? Right? So these little facts I can sneak in. The other reason that I do what I do is the hope to inspire others to believe in their potential to create whatever it is their heart desires, because I'm always challenging myself to do things I've never done before. In this case, I'd never played with electronic waste. I had never created structures and installations like this before. But through this process of just trying and problem solving and people coming together, um, I'm able to create this really spectacular stuff. But the stuff has a problem, right? The problem is that the work that I end up creating is actually quite unrelatable. And the reason is because when people look at this, they don't see themselves in the work that I do. After all, uh, not everyone has access to sponsors like Dell who are going to provide me with access to an electronic waste recycling facility on a Sunday in order to create something. And so, what is the solution? Well, one solution could be to change my style, but I've spent so long trying to build up this unique style to communicate important ideas uh, in whatever way possible, and so that's not really an option. So I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make my work more relatable with people. And one of the ways that I do that is by creating videos like these. How do you get people to talk about something that is ordinary, ugly, and boring? I wasn't too sure, but from experience, I know that the internet loves to see things that are extravagant, unique, and different. So applying that same concept to plastic bottles, having 10,000 of them seem like a great start at making something ordinary into something extravagant. With more plastic than fish in the sea scheduled for 2050, it made sense to add an ocean component to the project. A sea of plastic was interesting and sad, but it needed something unique and beautiful to truly stand out. What more unique and beautiful to represent the ocean than a mermaid? And so with the help of a waste management center called Tamara and a local artist called Cynthia, we ended up with 10,000 plastic bottles that came in a 50-foot truck, along with a beautifully designed, handmade mermaid tail. This unexpected combination, I felt, had the potential to be something truly different. So with all three components to make things shareable, the extravagant, the unique, and the different, I felt like we had all of the ingredients necessary to create something that could potentially make the boring topic of plastic pollution more shareable. As a shoot deadline creeped forward, dozens of volunteers joined us in our quest, contributing whatever they could, from helping us clean and delabel thousands of bottles, to rigging up my camera to the ceiling with plywood and pulleys, to borrowing a 52-inch TV from Costco. For the mermaid, talented artists came together to transform our beautiful model into a believable mermaid. And before I knew it, all the pressure was on me, waiting to see if the concepts would work or just be flushed down the drain.
As the day flew by, volunteers worked tirelessly, pushing bottles around, collecting them, organizing them by color before tossing them right back out onto the floor to create a new set of patterns that some crazy photographer had told them to do. Slowly but surely, an extravagant, unique, and different series appeared, just like I had hoped. But deep in the back of my mind, one nagging thought remained. How much difference could a series like this possibly make in encouraging people to stop using plastic bottles? Honestly, I'm not sure, but I guess I'm about to find out. So with the help of a simple video, um, the same photograph that you just saw two minutes ago has now become a lot more relatable. And why is that? It's because we talk a little bit more about the process, the process of how a bunch of people just came together in order to create something that didn't exist before. A bunch of people came together to fight for something that they believed in. And these are only the elements that looked the prettiest. I, in the video, I didn't talk about how I happened to be in Montreal because my sister was getting married, and how my mom was the one that actually found the mermaid tail when she was looking for um, someone to fix my sister's wedding dress, or, or, or how the reason we had a warehouse to play in was because I had shot the guy's wedding five years back before he owned anything. Right? So these, th at the end of the day, it's all these different story elements that we can bring together in order to make something that is seemingly really complex and unattainable into something a little bit more accessible. But it's not just about process. Process alone isn't enough. So I want to take this photograph as an example. It's a type of work that I used to create uh, before my social impact days. This was a commercial created for a company called Ballantines, and they wanted me to do the craziest thing that I had never done before. And I said, OK. Um, I found this underwater river online. It's in Mexico. It's 30 meters underwater. There's a toxic layer of hydrogen sulfide that's squashed between some fresh water and some salt water. And um, it looks like an underwater river. And I thought it would be really cool to put a boat on an underwater river. It's just kind of funny. And so they said, OK, let's do it. Um, they custom made this bird. Uh, it's a taxidermied bird that was flown in from some country. We built a boat, a super heavy boat that had to be lugged from uh, through the forest and dropped into the cenote. We gathered all these divers that flew in hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment and dropped it down 30 meters under in order to create this photograph. And so I've just shared with you the process on how this project came to be, but really none of it is relatable, right? Now, let me tell you another story about a very similar photograph. This photo was taken 30 meters underwater, just like the other one, but this time in a shipwreck in Bali. Now, it happened when I was supposed to be on vacation. Uh, my parents were trying to convince me to go on a vacation. I really didn't want to. I hate vacations. And um, they, they said, well, you can learn diving. And I was like, oh, OK, maybe that would work. And as I looked around trying to figure out what to do, once I got my dive certification, I saw a shipwreck. And I, I, and I was like, if there's a shipwreck, then I need to do a photo shoot. If I need a photo shoot, I need a model. If I need a model, I need a dress. And there was no more vacation. But what was really interesting was that I, when I landed there on the Saturday and I met up with a dive master, uh, who was uh, introduced by a friend that I had met on Facebook, and I told him my wild idea to do this photo shoot. He kind of looked at me a little crazy because I didn't have a dive certification yet. But lo and behold, after two days of dive training and a bunch of emails back and forth with different people, on Wednesday I got my dive certification. On Thursday we went down and did this project, and this was what came out of it. Now this process, though, is a lot more interesting. And why? Because it's a lot more accessible. It's got this situational accessibility, this idea of a vacation gone a little bit crazy, but not too crazy so that, it can't be, that you can't connect with it. And beyond situational access, there's also emotional accessibility. Who here is scared of sharks? Anyone here scared of sharks? It's like sharks have a really bad rep. Uh, we kill like 100 million of them every year, and I think they kill maybe three or four people a year, which might sound horrible, but more people die from selfie stick-related deaths than sharks, and yet no one's scared of them. And, and so <laughs> I like to use this emotional connection that people have to things, whether it's fear or excitement, depending on which side of the spectrum you fall, and leverage that as a tool, too, to connect with people. Because while you might not relate to being tied underwater 12 meters under, this idea of a shark swimming around uh, might terrify you. And then through that, once again, I can trick people into explaining the situation 
on how we shouldn't actually fear sharks, and that out of the 300 species of 300 plus species of sharks that exist out there, only a few are even close to being dangerous. Um, another example of emotional uh, access is maybe the fear of heights. Anyone here scared of heights? I personally love heights. I like if I if I have the opportunity to, I always go to the highest place I possibly can and look over. But for most others, they have this kind of lurch in this feeling, and this is something that is universal. It doesn't matter what culture you're from, doesn't matter from what place you're from. And so when Nike reached out to me and said they wanted to promote their shoes, I said, "Oh, what if we had people running off the side of the buildings?" They offered me Instagrammers, and I pushed back. I said, "What about using social entrepreneurs?" And so we found these social entrepreneurs. This is Mike. He's he's running off the side of the building, which is actually a building. Um, a, a low-income housing building that he brought a basketball court to in order to bring sports to underprivileged children's lives, and we we created this story as a result. And while the whole setup of this might be a little bit crazy and unrelatable, this fear of heights, this idea of an ordinary person challenging himself to do something he's never done before, is something that we can all relate to. I have this series of photographs that I created for a company. Um, they're called Smug Mug, and and they wanted epic black and white portraits of their employees showing off their guns because they had just renovated a new gym and wanted to print them out to motivate their employees. I thought it would be really cool to make that as epic as possible, so we created、uh, PVC pipes and garden sprinklers and passed water through them and created a little rain machine.、And、so for fifty dollars, we had this really cool trick to make everyday people look really, really cool.、And、so that's actually the CEO, that's his wife in the middle, and that's the head of marketing on the other side. <laughs> and so when I launched this project. To a photography audience, we called it the $50 trick to epic portraiture, and it performed pretty well because photographers were really excited about this new trick that they could apply to their everyday workflow. The rest of the world didn't care because they're not going to do that with their, their their cell phones, right? And so, when I really tried to connect with the rest of the world, because the rest of the world are the people that hire photographers,、um, we decided to relaunch the entire campaign this time. On the first of January. Why the first of January? Because that's when everyone makes their New Year's resolutions. They make their New Year's resolutions, perhaps, to go to the gym. And so we relaunched the campaign and focused not on the end result, but rather the transformation of ordinary people transformed into extraordinary, extraordinary athletes. And at the end of the day, it created a brand new connection with people. This time, around the idea that you could. Look extraordinary if you just hired a great photographer.、Yeah. No need to go to the gym. <laughs> And so these are just three examples of how you make things a little bit more accessible through situations, through emotions,、um, and through the different human characteristics of what makes us who we are and what we care about. Now, artists have. A really hard time on social media. I think it, this this digital age has really transformed things because everyone is trying to look as great as possible. Everyone wants to be perfect. Everyone's trying to put their best foot forward. And I don't think it's maybe maybe not just artists, but just everyday people. Anyone who's on social media struggles a little bit with this. And the funny thing about it is that although we try so hard to be perfect, what we can end up doing, I feel, many of the times, is just hurt our ability to connect with others. It actually often weakens. Um, it, it weakens us. So this project is another example、um, uh, that I did a while back,、um, and the idea was to showcase employees, their customer support heroes, showing off to what great heights they would go for their customers. And so we thought it would be a fun idea to dress them up as superheroes and put them on the edge of a 40-story skyscraper.、Um, but At the end of the day, after we did the project, after I edited the whole thing, trying to make it look as polished as possible, the, the, the nicest result that I could, and I showed it to people, and people were like, "Is it real?" And so all this effort that went into creating something, and my desire to make it look as good as possible, ended up making the final result less relatable than the fun photos we took afterwards with the volunteers who were just hanging around and goofing off because they wanted a cool picture of themselves. And so it's really. The struggle that is so important to connect everyone together, right? You know, when I when I invite volunteers to come on my projects, and I'm going to use my laptop shot as an example, which was the first image I opened the presentation with,、um, you would expect them to be really excited about being there to see the end result, and they are, but that's not their favorite part. 
Invariably, it seems like the favorite part of the people who come to my projects is just watching me suffer, watching me struggle, watching me fail and make mistakes, and actually just be an ordinary person. So, like this. This circle pattern is, um, was created with the help of a guy I met on a beach a few years back. And uh, I had seen a spiral on Blade Runner, and I thought, oh, cool, I want to create the same thing, this solar array using laptops. So we got there to the electronic waste recycling facility, laid the whole thing out. I had this vision of what I wanted to create. I had a very detailed pencil sketch. It wasn't very detailed. Um, and, and, and we laid this out for about four hours. And at the end, I looked at the shot, and I realized I had set it all up in the wrong place. And so my girlfriend was pretty upset at me because she had set it up. And so then she, she really wanted me to be sure that I had set it up in the wrong place. And she said, OK, are you sure? Do we have to move it? Yes, we have to move it. OK, we'll move it. So we moved it, and I encountered my next struggle. I had pitched to my sponsors this idea of creating projections on the back of the wall. Um, they had sent over four projectors, and we're going to create this these projections that were supposed to make the whole set look like another universe. But it ended up just looking like a projector, a projection. It didn't look very good. And so I realized then and there that I was going to have to change my entire concept. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do because I hadn't thought about it. Right? So we're, we're there. We have a week to do this whole thing. And here I am, and my, my carefully laid out plans had gone completely down the drain. And we had to think about a new solution. So I went home that night. I struggled, I stressed, I couldn't sleep, and I came up with this other idea. I'm like, okay, well, maybe we can just create our own wall. And, and so the next morning, we went out and we bought 12 big pieces of plywood that we, we painted all green, and the body painter who was on the set, who had came a few days earlier to help out, ended up creating this amazing pattern. The model who was there came up with this awesome idea of putting hinges on the doors so that we could curve the background instead of having it flat. And at the end of the day, after all these struggles were worked through, we ended up with the final result, and all that was left to do was line the whole shot up, hide a volunteer behind the model with a leaf blower, put a flash on a drone, fly it all up, and take a pretty picture. And so all this work, all this struggle to create a final product where actually the journey, the accessibility, and the struggle are actually far more powerful than the end result. It's this process of just trying your best to go from concept to execution, the process of gathering volunteers, the process of learning something new. It's the accessibility, so you ignore the things that people can't really connect to too much. You don't talk about um, the sponsors. You don't talk about the facility. You don't talk about the technical dive issues, because that's something that's really complicated to people. And you have to keep the struggle as much as possible, and that's the hardest part, because no one likes to share struggle. We live in a world which encourages perfection. It shows us every day on a news feed that never ends, the seemingly extraordinary people doing extraordinary lives, doing extraordinary things. But beneath that fancy veneer of extraordinary lies a process and a struggle that is actually very ordinary. So the next time you look up to somebody and you think to yourself, man, I wish I could start my own company, or I wish I could just travel the world, or I wish I could make a difference. Well, guess what? You actually can. Thank you.